Today, the norms of communication technology use seems to suggest that we do a lot more of observing other people's interactions rather than actually interacting on these social media. But if my kid is on, you know, the sideline throwing a fit, then I'm helping her, you know? So I think when you think of it that way too, you're like, well, we're just not documenting a lot of times the lows. We're documenting the highs. Unification of communication, the communification podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is the first season, the very first episode of the Communification Podcast, and I'm so happy you're here. Mahalo for your support from the bottom of my heart. I'm hopeful that what's discussed in this podcast will be helpful for all of us. And I'm so appreciative of you, my tribe. Thank you to the Bucket List family for lending me their matriarch, Jessica G, and a huge mahalo to Dr. Erin Spotswood for sharing her knowledge and research with us. All right. Are you ready to get into it? Personally, I'm actually going to re-watch this episode today and take notes so that I can journal about this and unpack it a bit more. If you want to do the same, get your journal out, get that pen out, because research shows when we write things down, we're more likely to process that information and to actually do the dang thing. And Lord knows I need help in this area. I'm embarrassed to admit that in kindergarten, my son was asked, I is for, and he wrote, Instagram. Yep, that's my kid. <laughs> so I thought an overview of the impact social media is having on us would be a great place to start season one, communication and technology. I had a fabulous time chatting with mega influencer Jessica G of the Bucket List family. Did you know she studied communication in college? Such a small world. And the things she had to say and share definitely shifted my perspective on a few things. That's the second part of today's show because our discussion was centered on what we learned from Dr. Erin Spotswood. In the first 30 minutes of this episode, we will dive deep with Dr. Spotswood. We talk about comparisons. We talk about authenticity. We talk about deception. We dive into the positivity bias and how people often present their best selves online. How is that impacting us? She shares surprising findings about romantic jealousy in relationships and what we can do to help better our communication. And she introduces us to her latest research, the hyperperception model. I'm gonna break this down for you in layman's terms because Erin and I speak about a million words a minute. So when you get to that part of the podcast, now you'll have a little bit of a foundation to work off of. All right, hyperperception is when a person observes two people interacting on social media. So you're reading the comments or you see a post and you perceive that the interaction or relationship between those two people is more intense than the two people that you are observing would actually say it is in reality. So you hyper perceive the closeness of the relationship these two people are having. Mm -hmm. Have you been there? <laughs> Without further ado, Let's introduce you to our expert today. Dr. Erin Spotswood researches how communication technology impacts people's everyday lives and close relationships. Through her research, she strives to teach people how to use these digital tools respectfully and compassionately. She also researches digital literacy, accessibility, and usability issues, and comes up with solutions to make informational communication technologies more human-centered. Aloha, Dr. Spotswood. Thank you for joining us for the premiere episode of the Communification Podcast. I've been reading your research for many years now. I'm so thrilled to get the opportunity to have you on the show. So welcome. Malika, I cannot take that. That is a little bit too much positivity and praise for me. Um, I am just a humble person that's very interested in these topics and likes talking about them with other people who are similarly interested. Um, it's kind of just weird to be in a field where I get to think and research and talk about the very things that seem to occupy so much of our daily lives now, especially during the pandemic when it comes to social media and communication technology. So it's a, it's a thrilling time to be in this field and it's really just a, a, a privilege to talk with you because if I'm really honest, the only thing academics thrive on people getting interested and following up and continuing to build upon the work. And so there isn't like, it's never one and done. It's never like put to rest. It's an ongoing living, breathing field. Uh, and so I, I it's meeting people like you that are just as passionate and interested and engaged as I am, 
um, if not more, maybe. Uh, it's just it's just a treat. It's like what better way to spend a Sunday afternoon? Well, I'm so happy that you're here with me. And actually, I want people to know more about you. So why don't we start first with why you are so interested and passionate about this field of computer mediated communication and maybe talk a little bit about your areas of study. Well, I've always been fascinated with uh, communication technology, especially how people connect through computers. I was one of those starting early off on AIM, you know, going in chat rooms. Uh, I could still hear AOL dialing up in my parents' basement, like in my in my memory. Um, and I've always just found it to be just a fascinating thing of how and why people use technology to connect, because it seemed at, 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 at face value very very disparate to what most people seem to value in human connection and communication. But I thought and I felt and experienced that sometimes when you're not face to face with the person, you're able to connect and communicate in ways that aren't better or worse, that are just different and sometimes can be more authentic. Now that was a very different communication technology landscape than the one we live in today. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to pursue this field in particular, because it's always evolving, it's always changing, and it's now seeming to become increasingly the way we interact with others. But if we don't take into account the features and affordances of these technologies, we may end up getting into a little bit of self-psychological or interpersonal or even broader social fallout um, or have different types of negative consequences. So if anything, I really hope my research helps people pause, <laughs> helps people kind of assess if what it is they're really perceiving on social media is, is, is reality. Because we don't know face-to-face -face perception is not always reality. You know, we may walk away from a conversation thinking it went one way, they may think it's gone entirely another way, and that's face-to-face. -face. When you do strip out more of the context out by having it be mediated, there can be a whole lot more perceptual kind of circus, circus shenanigans that can happen. And so it's important for people to kind of like take pause and remember that like just they're only getting one side and a very filtered, mediated side of a conversation or of an interaction. And just to kind of like, if you are really concerned about what it is you're seeing or what it is you're experiencing on social media, then talk to people that it's also relevant about. Like that's what I'm, I hope people will take away from my research. It's like, you know, technological perception is even further away from reality than they might think. Just talk to people, <laughs> talk to people about <laughs> what it is you're worried or feeling and get stuff straightened out. And then in the future, when similar things arise, you won't have the same kind of, you know, mental gymnastics happening. So yeah. <laughs> There's so much yeah. to unpack. <laughs> I talk kind of like, a, uh, I don't know, a hundred miles a minute. And um, even my students sometimes are like, can you slow it down, doc spots? <laughs> yeah. Is that what they call you, doc spots? Some of them do. I love it. It's, it's important to remember, even though I think I do believe that there does need to be a certain amount of professionalism and decorum that exists in academia and in the classroom especially, but I also want my students to relate to me too as a human. Learning is fun, and I think it should be. And that's what this podcast is all about. So let's dive right in. So I think um, first I'll introduce the topic for today, and today's communication topic is quite broad by design. We hope to dive into specific areas in future episodes, but today we're just trying to get a general understanding of how social media impacts our communication and the way we show up in the world. So I wanted to introduce the listeners, hi everyone, thanks for joining us, to Patrick O'Sullivan's concept of mass personal communication. Let's just go right down to the basics. So he developed this framework and it's a chart. So just imagine a cross, where one axis is access, so how private or public a message is, and the other axis is personalization, so how personal or impersonal the communication is. So mass communication is in one box because it's impersonal, it's broadcast to the public, to the masses, while interpersonal communication is between a small number of people that share some sort of relationship. So, so that's placed opposite mass communication. But then you have mass personal communication that can be both 
impersonal and private, like a spam message in your email inbox or DMs, but mass personal communication can also be personal and public, which describes what we're talking about today when it comes to social media. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the chart, but I'll also put the chart in the show notes for those of you that are listening so that you can see it too. So I mean, Dr. Spots, Doc Spots, <laughs> so much has changed over the last 10 to 15 years. We can share things of a personal nature, but it's posted for many people to see. We are communicating something, but we aren't even quite sure which part of that defined audience, if you have a private account, or mass audience will be actually receiving this message or how it'll be perceived on the other end and interpreted. So my question for you is, what does the research say about how people have been navigating social media when it comes to this self-presentation and impression management. So one thing that's unique about uh, a lot of social media technologies is that it uh, has affordances such as identifiability, which is the extent to which uh, what a person posts online is linkable and traceable back to their offline persona, uh, some you know who they are uh, according to their birth certificate, their workplace, uh, their corporal self. So that's one thing a lot of social media provide is that, and then um, uh, accessibility and persistence. So the extent to which what you post on social media can be accessible by many people outside of the con the two people that are interacting in a particular platform, and then it persists there, right? That long after that interaction is there, it stays there for a while after. And of course, not all social media have that affordance, like for example, Snapchat, right, doesn't have the persistence factor, doesn't really have the identifiability factor, whereas Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter have more of these affordances, right, of identifiability, accessibility, and uh, persistence. And when you have that, and then uh, couple that with like this idea and concept of mass personal communication, you can have two people seemingly have a very interpersonal, intimate conversation, but that's there for everyone to see and uh, appraise and make uh, perceptions. Sometimes even you might call hyper perceptions of the interactions that they are witnessing. So I've actually, in the past several years, I've dedicated uh, my research agenda along with a colleague of mine from Western Illinois University, Dr. Uh, Christopher Carpenter. Um, tenured professor there, we developed something called the hyperperception model, which is a preda it's a it's extension of the hyperpersonal model. Where you know in the past when it was like most people didn't have a lot of communication technologies, they didn't have these uh, identifiability, accessibility sorts of well they did have accessibility and persistence but not necessarily so much in terms of identifiability so you could witness two people or see two people having a, an intimate conversation online but not necessarily be able so easily to link that to offline personas social media though makes that way different meaning and also today the norms of communication technology use seems to suggest that we do a lot more of observing other people's interactions rather than actually interacting on these social media. So what does that mean? You are doing a whole lot of observing people that you know interact with other people that you know and other people you don't know as well. Um, and this can lead to a variety of different perceptual effects. Uh, sometimes that can result in negative consequences to the observer, such as romantic jealousy, loneliness, anxiety, and depression. And how do you help users take a step back? How do we help everyday people remember that, you know, uh, digital perception is not actual corporal reality? Like, how can you get people to get back on track with that? So first you have to kind of establish that the phenomenon is there. And that's what the hyperperception model is all about. Observing other people's intimate interactions. Like, so for example, let's say you have uh, Sylvia. She's in a relationship with Marco. Sylvia one day goes on to Facebook, is just scrolling around like we do, right? Waiting for the next thing to happen in life, whatever that may be in a pandemic, who can say? She's scrolling through her Facebook and she sees uh, Marco in a post. She sees that um, a person named Tina, who she's never met before, posts a picture of her, several others, but Marco is also in the picture and then there's also in the in the in the and maybe a title for, for the photo or whatever like had the best time ever. This was so much fun. I uh, can't wait to meet and do this with all of you again. But again, because she doesn't know Tina, right? She uh, 
she has no way. It, what is what is going on? What is what is what is happening? It doesn't seem affiliated with Marco's work. Like she, Sylvia is very confused. And human beings have always been very interested in the relationships and interactions of those we're close to, right? Like that. Like when you think about the bulk of your conversations with the people you're close to, it's like the interactions they're having with other people, right? Mm -hmm. The the relationships and how they're how they're doing with other people. So it's like a, it's like it's just so it, it, it's. No wonder that like we do this on social media when these sorts of things pop up in our feeds. And so maybe then also Sylvia scrolls down and sees the comments that Marco has hearted the post. Uh oh. Uh oh. And then also maybe left a comment like, had the best time ever, can't wait, blah, blah, blah. And um, you know, now Sylvia's like, ah, ah, what is that? Who what who is this Tina? Maybe she she's never met, she doesn't know Tina before, and and the not knowing the uh, observed receiver of the observed senders, in this case, Marco, right? Like, Marco's the observed sender because, like, she, he's, he is the person that Sylvia is really interested in appraising his interactions on social media. Tina is this unknown receiver. And the less you know this observed receiver, the more likely you'll develop hyperperceptions because you don't have any way to contextualize the interactions you're seeing. If, for example, Sylvia knew that Tina was Marco's cousin, not as worried. Right. Like, maybe they were just a family thing like you know your brain's uh, like uh, very but if you don't know what the situation is you don't know what's happening your brain is more likely to like go Ooh. um and this you know stems off also of like just a lot of interpersonal and 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 individual psychology research and theories about how we are interested in those we're close to their relationships we are we do mate guarding right we we want to fend off people that might try and interfere in our relationships in any way, shape, or form, where we're worried of, of rivals. Um, and so, yeah, so that's what the model is about. And there's also certain aspects of social media too, like the norms of these technologies. Like I've often, I've even done research about the positivity bias on social media and how we just are inclined to only put our best face forward mm -hmm. on social media. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not uncommon in everyday life. It's like, I mean, who knows what we'll all look like when we emerge from our caves after the pandemic. But <laughs> normally, you know, uh, when you go to the office, when you go and meet up with people outside, if you can remember what that was like, um, it's not uncommon to like put on an outfit you feel good in to, 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 you know, to groom yourself the way that you feel most attractive. So it makes sense that the stuff we put on social media is emblematic, emblematic of that too, of how we want to be perceived. Um, and, and in our best light, and that we'll post things that make us seem positive, attractive, popular, interesting, fun. Um, but because of this, the staticness of this and the filtering out of unflattering content, again, when you get a, a social media side of someone, you're only getting their selectively edited self mm -hmm. uh, because of the positivity bias too on social media, given its persistence feature or afford and sorry. And so you only see this observed receiver's best self. And so then the comparisons too, you're more likely to compare them higher to you because you're, I mean, Sylvia, right, is probably observing this maybe in her sweats at home after a long day, like, oh no. And now she's seeing like these curated edited photos of Tina and only what she's willing to be allowed to the general public. And it could, this might ring a whole lot of alarm bells. So, right. Yeah, we've mostly been looking at this in terms of romantic jealousy because it explains, one, why social media lends to that. So far, that work has been, for the most part, atheoretical. Now we have a model that predicts and explains why this happens and what people can do. Like, one of the coolest findings we had in return was in some of our open-ended questions, the feedback we got was very interesting. They, we found that when uh, there was just an, an authentic conversation about the partners or observers' concerns. It opened up new lines of communication and relationship. It fostered trust, understanding, and empathy, and actually brought people to closer. Like, I'd assume talking about these sorts of hyperperceptions would lead to friction in a relationship. But, I mean, obviously, there are some times where that was true, but more often than not, we saw the opposite. Wow. Well, on a broader scale, so we're talking about relationships, but I know that I've experienced this. I heard it from a lot of the listeners that I polled before doing this interview that they are concerned about 
being bombarded with perfect images of people's lives. And can you talk a little more about the, what the research is saying of how that's impacting us? I know there's some research about passive you know, consumption of social media and how that impacts us. And you talked a little bit about comparisons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, actually, so there, you're right that there is a fair amount of work that says passive social media use can lead to a variety of negative or detrimental psychological outcomes like anxiety, loneliness, and depression. And in part, I think it also is because of this hyper-perceptual process. But instead of, in terms of just like romantic processes, it's like looking at your friends doing stuff or interacting without you that can lead to where am I in my social circle? FOMO. Why aren't people, yeah, exactly. Why aren't people including me in these online and offline engagements, interactions, events, etc.? cetera? It, it leads people to question how their individual relationships stand, how they uh, are ranked in their social circle. And it's often what we forget is just oftentimes things it's not always so intentional like we think it is right it's not like anyone left us out necessarily there are a variety of reasons why something happened and it, you weren't included but our brains don't work that way we have so many different types of biases um, that lead us to have these sorts of questions concerns and reservations and then hyperception hyperperception processes so if you switch switch out from the observe of the observed receiver so imagine sylvia now is no longer thinking about marco Sylvia is now looking at her close friends, Lily, Trixie, and May. Like she has these very, very close friends. And she sees them doing stuff and posting about stuff on social media, maybe a few times without her. That make, may, might make her worry, like maybe I'm not as close to these people as I thought. Maybe she sees them interacting, but then she's not a part of it. She sees them posting about stuff they're doing and she isn't there and she's not included. And um, she may be wondering, like, well, maybe I'm not as close to these people as I thought. Maybe um, they're trying to kind of push me out of the friend group, and it might make her have all these kind of similar kind of, like, social worries um, that are similar but still different uh, from, like, romantic jealousy worries. And really what people sometimes forget is how do you – so, for example, maybe uh, Sylvia sees them posting about a recent camping trip. And she suddenly might become like, oh, no, why didn't no one tell me? Why wasn't I included? Why blah, 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 blah. And she immediately goes down this, uh, you know, devolves down the spiral of fear when in reality, maybe no one invited her because a long time ago she told all of them or maybe one of them that she hates camping. And, like, your brain just forgets that, right? Your brain just, we, we are because we're social creatures and we hate to feel like we're not included, at least not invited about things. Um, but then we also forget that people often are very uh, mindful of their time and, and resources and won't waste asking someone about something if they believe that answer is already going to be a no. We only have so much time and energy in the day. And so it's you know, trying to remember that what people post on social media is not hundred percent reality it's part of reality and if it gives you concern then talk to the people about your concerns don't just let your brain go into like hyperdrive hyper perception mode just talk to people and remember that you're only getting a slice of the of the reality pie if that um, and and even that like what what feels or, or, or you know it's like getting a picture of a of, of get seeing a picture of a piece of pie on social media versus seeing it in person like there's so much there's so much left out it's not that what you it's not like that it's not like that picture isn't there it's not like that post isn't there i mean it's not all fake but it is curated it is edited mm -hmm. because when we believe there's a static representation of ourselves and our relationships somewhere that anyone can visit at any time given its accessibility and persistence we want to make sure that what we share is going to be positively appraised by whoever stumbles upon it like we want to be perceived as good but that's that makes sense we just have to remember that everyone else is doing that too so like don't just compare your offline self to other people's online selves if anything compare your online self to other people's online selves right like before <laughs> you start before you click on these other people's profiles and start appraising all of their content do a side-by-side -side comparison 
I mean, you can have multiple windows open at the same time, side by side. Like, is there really that different? Is what they're doing really that different? Mm -hmm. Then maybe even engage in some other fun exercises, like what do they look like at the end of the day after a long, hard day when everything's washed off or first thing in the morning, you know, like, yes, let us get, have some creative. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know what that made me think of? I had some other listeners, um, Tara B, Melissa and Keala, they brought up that they struggle with their impression management and their self-presentation because they have social media accounts that are not just personal. They either have a business and a personal, or they have one where they do both and they struggle with how to manage that self-presentation because you have a business, but you're also a person. So being comfortable with that. Well, I think it's not asking too much of yourself in either capacity. Because when you are at work or doing things for work, you are your authentic work self. That is a part of you. I think sometimes people have a hard time realizing it's okay to compartmentalize the different aspects of their life, especially when it comes to technology where the blending and blurring of all these boundaries seems to be impossible. It's okay to sometimes present something that's just what you, who and what you do for professional reasons. And, and that is a part of you. That's not inauthentic. It's just what you're doing in that particular instance using that platform for your brand or business. It's, it's not not you, it's a part of you. And it, like, that's okay. It's, don't, just because something is highly curated or edited doesn't mean it's bad or wrong or gonna co- I mean, you can't control how other people will interact or engage or perceive your content. So don't worry about that. Like, that's all good and fine. Don't ask too much of yourself about being authentic. It's just like, realize it's okay to not have to feel like you have to be 100% authentic on social media all the time. Sometimes I think authenticity or trying to be can almost be toxic in and of itself, right? Like, I, because, you know, when I, for example, when I give a presentation for work and a lot of people are there, or even like for this, this podcast now that you're being, that I'm being recorded, like I still think about what I'm going to say, practice, prepare, make sure I... I'm relatively put together because it's being recorded. And and this is still me. This is very authentically me. But it's like what I'm doing for the purposes of my work and my brand as an expert in this space. And I, that's, that's aligns with a lot of my personal and professional goals. So just, you know, be okay with just achieving a goal in another moment and then moving on to the next after the fact. I love that because my mind goes like a a million miles a minute and I start thinking, oh gosh, well, I have to be authentic. Okay. So now, um, and I read this actually in some research recently. Oh, I can't remember the researchers, but they're in Vienna at the University of Vienna and um, they research journalism and communication. And so they were talking about authenticity labor and That just got me thinking and I'm going, oh my gosh, it's so true. Like I'm trying so hard to be authentic that now it is a labor. And so then, then you get meta and you go, because I'm trying to be authentic. Does that mean I'm not authentic anymore? (laughs) Well, that's why like there, I think we just, we all put way too much pressure on ourselves given the affordances and features of these technologies and just realize you're never going to 100% satisfy any goal in a persistent space like this for a variety of reasons. Goals change, times change, norms change. So just do the best you can at that moment and be gracious and kind to yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, don't, don't read the, don't read the comments. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Well, okay. I do have a listener that wanted to weigh in and ask you a question. So is that okay? Hi, Malika and Dr. Spotswood. This is Jamie. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. My question is, how can you tell if online communication is genuine or authentic if you can't see some of the cues that you might see in in in-person or face-to-face interactions? Jamie's asking about those nonverbal cues being filtered out in online communications. What do you think? Well, I think to start off, there's a fallacy in assuming that nonverbal cues actually help you determine the veracity of another person's statement. Um, This is often, uh, people often uh, have these fallacies or false thoughts because a lot of media and popular culture makes us think uh, if they're shifty, if they don't look you in the eye, uh, et cetera, et cetera, then there's a likelihood that you're being duped or, or someone's being duplicitous. 
And that's just not the case. Uh, people can look you dead in the eye and be lying straight to your face. It can be lying and natural. And look, one of the things, I'm a big fan of the show Survivor. If anything, watching that show will let you know. People are more, more than capable of, of deceit and being comfortable and easy and gracious and whatever else. So just because you don't have nonverbal cues at your disposal doesn't mean you're going to be more or less likely to determine whether or not someone's being authentic or honest. Um, if anything, what will help you more that often than not is when you have verbal information that you can verify with other information uh, to give you sense whether or not something is true or not. So, for example, and this is one of the best things about the internet: someone can post something that's so false, and someone can go right back like, uh, "Nope, fact check, don't think so." So, nonverbal cues are not a direct way to determine the authenticity or honesty of another person's statements. Um, now, again, this is aligned a little bit with this idea that we do tend to post our best faces on social media, but again, that is still an authentic aspect of who you are in your everyday life. I mean, this is very different from like people making fake accounts, but for the most part, people don't do a whole lot of that, but it's, most of us don't have the time or energy. I can barely keep up with my own social media. I can imagine also keeping up like fake accounts. So most of the time you don't really have to be worried about that. So don't worry. And most people are honest most of the time anyway. It's just adaptive. There's this great book by uh, Professor Timothy Levine called Duped uh, that goes into all about the more, not just like online, but off, for the most part offline deception research and the, the model that he's put together. Um, or truth default theory, and uh, it's, yeah, so again, like you don't, I mean, even online, you don't have to, most people are honest most of the time, both online and offline, especially because, if anything, people are more inclined to be honest and authentic in certain places online because they, 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 they're receipts, there are receipts, and they have their receipts, and so, you know, you don't want to get, you don't want to get truth bombed by anybody, so yeah, so... Yeah. I hope that was helpful and reassuring that that's not like a major thing to be worried about. But if there is a particular specific instance that you're worried about something, then investigate that thing. But don't necessarily generalize it to all mediated uh, communication uh, all the time. So, yeah. Yeah, that made me think of warranting theory with um, Walter and Park's warranting theory, you yeah. know, and those yeah. cues that you use to, that you perceive as reliable cues to gauge if someone's yeah. true identity matches what they present online. So LinkedIn is a perfect example where, you know, you, um, someone maybe presents that they have computer skills and others now endorse this person. And you're way more likely to believe that person is telling the truth because there are all these warnings warrants, these cues that show you. So I love that you brought that up, that online, um, sometimes we can, maybe maybe most times, we can actually verify if someone is being authentic and truthful with us more so than in person, because in person, uh, what are you, you going to do? You're just looking at their nonverb, like, yeah, if they blink their left eye, it means this. Like, <laughs> when it comes to online, you can actually look for concrete information. Yeah, and you're better able to register it and verify it because when you're talking face to face, like we're both fast talkers, I think that's clear. And um, it can be difficult sometimes to retain everything the other person is saying to verify later. And you know, so if anything, you're more, you have more tools at your disposal to verify information uh, and its authenticity and veracity online than you are offline. Um, so it also though depends on a variety of other factors too, like digital accessibility and literacy, which I know is outside of the scope of the question, but you know, still relevant to mention no all the same. Yes. All right. Well, we're wrapping it up now. I know I can't keep you forever, even though we could talk for forever <laughs> in our That's fast paced. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we get a lot out. <laughs> All right, so what are some research-based strategies or tips that you can provide for us to help with the beautification of our communication over social media? So today we talked about um, misunderstandings, you know, um, authenticity, self-presentation, how we present our, our best selves online. So what are some tips that you can give people with, with all of this? When you are using social media, Remember that everyone's doing the same thing. 
They're all posting their best faces forward and they're all living up to positivity norms because no one wants to look like a total jerk on social media. Like maybe, you know, after Tina posted that thing with her and Marco on social media, maybe Marco was like in his, in, in, on his own was like, maybe he is really annoyed by Tina in, in offline, whatever. But online, you don't want to be rude or mean or anything else for most of us, most of the time. So, you know, he does what's the kind thing to do in response. He just hearts it and leaves a comment like, what a great time. We're all doing that all the time. How often do we actually put that much emotional investment into our hearts and comments and stuff on social media? I mean, how frequently really? So just remember, other people use social media very similar to you. If something really concerns you, rather than find more digital evidence of your friends going off without you or your partner being whatever this, ask them, talk to them. Don't just like scroll and look for more evidence and, and develop a kind of a feedback loop, right? Instead, just put the phone down, put the prep, close the computer and get away from it. Have a conversation, realize that perception is not always reality. Well, the other aspect that maybe we haven't talked about as much is just have empathy for yourself and other people. It is hard to learn how to use a technology when it's constantly changing and the norms and the features and the affordances are always in flux. So don't judge yourself for making mistakes. Don't judge other people for making mistakes. We have to be more kind and, and caring of ourselves and others. And, um, to be more open-minded and try and have some, do some other perspective taking when it comes to what you see on social media and just realize that just because you're getting a version of a person's self on social media, which is to a certain extent authentic, that's not the only thing that there is about a person. And uh, yeah, empathy, I guess. I love it. Today the other perspective, giving ourselves grace, and just have the dang conversation. If something's really bothering you and that's a relationship you care about, converse about it. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you so much for your time and expertise. I learned a lot. I hope those of you that are listening feel the same way. To all of you listening, we really just skim the surface when it comes to social media, but I'll provide resources for you in the show notes, links so that you can read up on this literature if you want to, or if you want to find out more about Dr. Spotswood. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a, it's been a pleasure and a privilege. Aloha, Jess. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being a part of the premiere episode. Gosh, Dr. Spotswood dropped some knowledge on us. <laughs> was there anything that stood out to you? Oh, there was so much. So I actually studied communications back in college. So when I listened to it, I was like, oh, this is so my alley. And then obviously with, with my career and everything, it's, um, it's so pertinent to, I mean, not only me, but I feel like almost everybody on this earth these days. Um, social media is such a huge part of our everyday lives, whether we like it or not, and the media in general and the internet. Um, so there was just so much that um, that I especially loved. For me, you know, especially I think over the last year, it's just been um, a different uh, experience for everybody, you know, and how the media come, plays into our lives and, and the role that it's had on my life um, has significantly changed of how I consume media and how I consume social media. Um, so things that she was saying, you know, like I've always been aware of it um, and how things can, you know, be inaccurate or how things can come across. And I think, I think we all just need to become smarter media users. I absolutely agree. Gosh, you know, for me, I think what stood out was the positivity bias stuff, you know, that People present their best selves online. I mean, I feel like we hear people complain about this all the time. It's a topic of discussion. So I really appreciated the research-based perspective shift that she provided, you know, that it's perfectly normal totally. for people to present their best selves. Like, not just the fact that we're doing that, but we also do it in face-to-face -face communication. You know, it's not a new totally. thing. It's just human totally. nature. 
that we want to be positive. Yeah. You know, we don't want to, you know, we're not going to put our worst foot forward, but I also think, you know, like we, we travel all the time with our kids, which is so, so difficult. And, you know, if sometimes people are like, gosh, it just seems like your kids are such good travelers. How are they so good? I'm like, well, they're really, they are really good travelers. But at the same time, like I don't have my phone out when kids are melting down on an airplane, you know, like, um, I think a lot of times, like in our lives, you know, when I'm watching my kids score or play soccer and score goals, like I've got my phone out and I'm documenting it. But if my kid is on, you know, the sideline throwing a fit, then I'm helping her, you know? So I think when you think of it that way too, you're like, well, we're just not documenting a lot of times the lows we're documenting the highs. And, um, and we need to understand that, you know, that everybody is documenting the highs and sharing. I mean, they obviously want to put their best foot forward, but I mean, for the most part, like when we need to reflect, when we need to help someone, when we need to help our families, like usually the cameras are away and that's a good thing. That's such a good point. I don't think I've ever thought of it that way. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> I mean, if Five Eyes melting down, first of all, if I do pull out the camera, it's not during the giant meltdown part of it. No. It's because it probably turned into something a little funny or something, you know, that yeah, I could totally, help her through. Totally. But like the really intense part, um, yeah, we're not concerned with getting our phone out. We're concerned with what's happening right now. And I need to deal with this right now. And a lot of times if we do talk about it, it's more of a reflection piece. Totally, totally, totally. Yeah. So the listeners might be wondering, as I am, what some of the struggles you face are when it comes to social media. I mean, I, I kind of see it two-sided. One myself as a creator and one myself as a, a consumer. Um, for me, especially this last year, it's been so difficult for me. I've experienced some anxiety and depression for the first time in my life. And I think a lot of that had to do with social media, with the media in general, I should say, I don't want to say necessarily just social media. Um, you know, it really, really took a toll on me and I had to really spend a lot of time self-reflecting and how the media impacted me and my mood and my anxiety and how it was just a giant trigger for a lot of what I was feeling. And, um, and I feel like maybe six months ago, I, I really kind of dug deep and figured out what do I want this to do for me? What do I want out of it? Um, how am I going to spend my time on social media? Um, if I am at all, you know, and, and what's going to be like healthiest for me as a consumer. And then on the other, on the flip side, there's the, there's the creator part, um, you know, and social media to, to me and my family, first and foremost, has always been a journal. Um, we're so happy that so many people are along for the ride. Um, but, but, you know, when we're creating content, we're, especially my husband, my husband, I would say is the, is the videographer and, uh, the photographer, but we, we record and we post what we want to remember, you know, and sometimes Sometimes that's the best. Usually that's the best of the best. Um, but sometimes it's the lows and we, we try to document that. And we try to share the story that we've experienced as a family. Um, I recently tore my um, ACL again in a heli, uh, heli skiing accident. And, um, you know, we shared the whole story and it was, it was devastating. It was super devastating. And some people don't want to see it. Um, but you know what? I think it's important to share everything. And I want to see, and I want to remember everything. And, um, I, I don't know if I'm quite ready to watch our like most recent video of me, like actually falling down the mountain in Utah, but, um, you know, that's going to be something I'm grateful for down the road. Yes, absolutely. I saw, I saw that on your Instagram that there were some negative comments and, and things like that. And, um, what I appreciate about you, which I'm also like acutely aware of, I think it's because we are aware of the positivity bias. You know, we are aware that our lives can look so perfect and picturesque and, you know, we share these beautiful moments, but it's so important to balance that perception out for others, you know, and share the bad, the difficult, the challenging, the failures, the, the heartbreaking moments, you know, so that other people's perceptions of, of what this beautiful life is, which it is a beautiful life, but so that it's a little more balanced, you know? I mean, personally, maybe you feel the same way I do. I don't want people to come to my social media and leave feeling like my life is perfect and I don't want them to compare their offline or online selves to my online self in that way, you know? So I, I think it was great advice when Dr. Spotswood talked about stop comparing, you know, your offline self yes. to your online self 
you know, and this positivity bias. You know, and I think um, we're not, she even mentioned this, like we're not meant, our brains are not meant to handle the approval of hundreds and thousands and millions of people, you know, like usually, um, you know, we're used to seeking the approval of our family members and our close friends. But when you have social media and the media where all of a sudden you have complete strangers chiming in on your life, like that can be really, really tough. And we're not, we're not meant to handle that. Yeah. It's really nice when it's the good stuff. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. So, so I mean, over the last year, I've kind of learned with my personal consumption of social media, I go into it with a few different ways. First of all, I've always said, um, I think we can put out good, bad, or nothing. And it's your choice, but I firmly believe that it's best to put out the good. I mean, yes, I'm going to share the highs and lows, but like, I'm going to put out positivity. And that goes for like my consumption as well. If I'm scrolling and checking in on my friends and family, I, I can say nothing and just scroll past, or I can like it and comment and be positive. So, you know, like when I am taking the time to sit down and social look on, um, you know, Instagram, which isn't that often anymore, I purposely go into it trying to give back rather than like get that instant gratification. You know, if I go into it being like, who can I compliment today? Who can I make feel better? Um, who can I DM, you know, like that's, that that's been so much healthier for me rather than trying to like, just kind of scroll, just the mindless scrolling, but where you can be an active participator in social media and hopefully really put out good, positive vibes and energy. Yes. And actually that rolls right into, I had a question from a listener. Is it okay if I play that right now for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Malika, Jessica, and Garriott. This is Thalia. Thank you for having me on the podcast. When I'm on social media, I feel a constant pressure to be perfect or to portray a perfect image. Ironically, I also feel pressure to share everything about my life, even the parts that aren't so perfect. But I need to frame it in a way to make it seem like I'm perfect. It makes me feel like I'm in a competition and I'm constantly comparing myself to the rest of the world, even to people that I've never met or I don't know, which is not always a good thing. More often than not, social media gives me anxiety and I just stop posting anything altogether. So my question is, How do you set and maintain healthy boundaries for sharing on social media? And how do you set and maintain healthy boundaries for consuming social media? I love it. I love that question. (laughs) Yeah, it's something I've really, like I was saying, I've really had to reflect on myself because I myself had so much anxiety and the internet just was just a huge trigger. Um, And for a while, I just, I had to delete it. I had to delete social media. I couldn't look online at the news. And um, you just need to be aware, you know, if you feel negative, then just delete it and wait until your mind and you're in a space where you can be positive, you know, like, you don't want to let anything into your life that's not, you know, like, you're, you should be in charge. Unfortunately, Instagram and social media and the news, uh, you're not always in control because they feed you what the algorithms want to feed you, you know? So even though you're there and you think you're in control, you're not. And that's sometimes where you get triggered and it's not your fault. And so it's best to just turn it off. You know, I've had friends who have followed influencers before. And one time, one of my best friends was saying, I can't follow this influencer more anymore because I just, I just think so negatively. And I was at first, I was like, well, I feel like you should work on that. You know, like, why would you just delete them? Like, don't you want to like have better thoughts? But then for me, I was like, no, you know what? If that's how it works for her, uh, either unfollow or delete your social media and just get off of it until you're in a space where it's a positive environment, just walk away. That's what I've had to do. I've had to walk away. We, as creators, we post, and my husband has stepped in a lot over the last year to manage the uh, community uh, because I can't, I can't deal. I can't handle the content comments. It's been too hard for me. Um, so I have to walk away in a lot of ways. Boundaries are so important in all aspects of life, but I think Absolutely. especially on social media, you know, really identifying, I guess our, our values, you know, identifying what we want out of social media, 
I mean, you know, you and I, we do this for work too. And so there's that, actually, a lot of people do it for work. There was that question yeah. from some listeners about, you know, balancing your authentic work self with your authentic self. And I, I thought that was great. I love it when she talked about that, when, you know, as a brand, because you want to put your brand forward. I actually, that, that was probably my main takeaway was, you know, like you want to be authentic, but at the same time, you know, your brand and that's okay. It's okay to be a brand and put your best foot forward. Like you don't need to feel unauthentic for doing that. I love that. I know. I love that too. <laughs> me too. It's like, Oh, thank you. You just lifted this weight off of me. <laughs> totally, totally, totally. And what about the authenticity labor part of it? So um, I did look it up. It was Dr. Hanush and Mars. I'm probably butchering their names, but they're from the University of Vienna. And I, I will link to it in the show notes for everyone listening. But um, what did you think about that idea of authenticity labor? I, I don't know. It just got me thinking so much about, you know, I, I, I want to be authentic. I want people to know the real me. And so now I'm thinking so much about being authentic. And wait a second, does that make me inauthentic that I'm thinking so much about being authentic? <laughs> I, I thought the same thing. And um, I think you just really have to decide what what this is for. Is this, like, why are you sharing to begin with? You know, like, do you want to keep in touch with friends and family? Um, do you want to, you know, create a business? Do you want to build a brand? Um, or do you want it to be for your own personal use? You know, I have a lot of friends who it's just basically their it's their journals that they use it to make chat books and to send those to family. And that's it. You know, like everyone has a different reason why they're even on social media and you need to understand what that is and why you're there. Because, um, if you're there to just waste time, I mean, you just need to be aware of it, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I think I've identified in the last couple of years that, you know, I want to inspire people personally, you know? And so, I love it. um, that's always in the back of my head whenever I post, you know, is like, okay, well, um, I, I want to present it in this way because this is my goal. And I loved hearing from Dr. Spotswood that that was okay. <laughs> you know, yes. it's okay to have a goal. It's, it's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Well, finally, I wanted to recap the strategies, the research-based strategies that Dr. Spotswood outlined for us. And then it would be great to hear some final thoughts from you on strategies that work for you or insights from your experiences with social media. You've already shared a few, but maybe as I go through the list, something will pop up for you. Yeah, so sure. Her advice was to give ourselves grace and give others grace, have conversations instead of heading down that hyperperception rabbit hole, realizing that we can never 100% satisfy a goal in such a persistent space, remembering that everyone else is doing the same thing. We all are doing this positivity bias thing. We're all, you know, um, doing the same thing. So don't compare yourself online to anyone online or offline. And don't be judgmental, be open-minded and realize that we're presenting our best selves and that's not so different from what we do in face-to-face -face communication. And also that people aren't so intentional with what they post. And the last one was don't read the comments. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my gosh, there's just so much there that's just so wonderful that I think we should literally all, all like read before we do step onto the internet. Um, for me, I think, the internet for the good and the bad, um, you know, Google and Instagram and Facebook, they have these algorithms that, that they feed us. They think they know what we want to see and they gather like-minded people. And so here we are, you know, me and you and a lot of our friends in Hawaii, we, we see each other's content and we, um, you know, if we're on an explore page, that's what we see. So here we are in Hawaii, kind of in our own little bubble, you know, or I have my like, religious bubble or I have my like health bubble you know you kind of see what you want to see and you're fed this and so when all of a sudden you see someone else like this other crazy extreme you are like where did that come from and that's where all this kind of hate has come over the last year or year and a half you know is um is whether we like it or not we've just kind of given ourselves drawn these lines and I feel like the world has just become so much more unaccepting because you know, people see what they want to see, whether we like it or not. Um, so I think when people are aware and open-minded, um, you know, that everybody has different situations, you know, and everybody sees essentially what Instagram thinks we want to see, because that's what we keep clicking on. You know, um, we just need to be mindful 
of that. And we need to be mindful that everybody really is, they just want to, they want to show their best selves. And that's good. That's a good thing. I, I want good out on the internet, you know, like, um, I don't, I think, I think the goal is to become less judgmental and less critical. So if we can just be mindful and give ourselves grace and patience with ourselves and with others, uh, the internet is, is a beautiful, beautiful place. I mean, I could go on for days about the wonderful things um, that people have said, the wonderful kind messages of how we've helped change their families' lives and inspired them to be more brave and to get out and explore the earth. Like there's so many, like that's what we wanna do. We wanna put out good and families and love and service. And so that's what the internet should be used for. Um, so why would we, you know, why would we ever want to cultivate hate? Like when we can cultivate love, um, that's just something that, you know, we all have this beautiful gift of the internet. So let's just all work together to, to just bring ourselves up. And I love how you do that as the bucket list family, you know, you're always putting out positivity and inspiration and encouraging people. I, I don't think that goes unnoticed. And so it, it's always nice to have someone in this space show a great example of how to manage and navigate and live in this digital world. So thank you to you for doing that. I love that you brought up a couple of things because now I'm thinking, okay, my next few episodes, communication and technology is this season, but the echo chamber, you know, that we just keep hearing what we want to hear. And it's, it's also, it's the algorithm, but it's also us. We end up muting things we don't want to see. We sign up for things we want to see, you know, so that could be a really cool episode, I think. And then the other side of it, the building community, you know, just that this space, can help people to feel less lonely. This space can help people people to feel like they have a community. This space can help lift people up. And so I think that I know there's research on that. So I'm going to look into that and I'm going to make sure that a new episode will definitely hone in on those. So thank you for (laughs) giving me that inspiration. Yeah, of course. It's it's super interesting, uh, you know, working in this space and understanding that. I feel like I have a deep understanding of that, what we just said. But, you know, I I struggle. I think we all struggle and that's okay. And I think from Dr. Spotwood's um, podcast, I, I think it made me feel a lot better that it's okay. Like it's okay to feel this way. And I think if we just work on ourselves and be mindful of it um, and, and approach the internet when we're ready, um, then, then that'll, that will lift us all up when we're all more prepared. Right. Guess what? We're all human. <laughs> Absolutely. All human. Thank you so much for sharing. And and to our listeners, if you want to learn more about the Bucket List family, their adventures, their struggles, their triumphs, I have a link in the show notes for you. And of course, you can sign up to be a part of their Ohana and become a member of the Bucket List Friends. So many cool bonuses there. And you also can hear them talk more in detail about how they deal with negativity online too, right? You have a special one that you did. Yeah, we do. All right. Well, and for anyone who wants to binge watch all things Bucket List family, that is a great place to go. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you, Malika. I'm so happy for you. You're doing this. This is so wonderful. Um, I, I am excited to share this with everybody. If Jessica shares this show, I think I might literally die (laughs) of happiness, of course. Oh, and I love having deep conversations with thoughtful people. I hope you feel like you learned a little something, you have a little nugget to apply to your life, or maybe this reinforced or challenged some of your personal ideas. Let's get those juices flowing. For anyone who wants additional resources, I have this episode transcribed and summarized, links to research and to Jessica and Aaron's bios and social media platforms, links to sign up for the email list and the Bucket List family's Bucket List friends, and of course, details on our monthly giveaways. That's all in the show notes. Just tap the link below this video. I would be so, so grateful if you would share this podcast with your family and friends follow, subscribe, and leave a little review sharing with me anything you learned or even suggestions for future topics, of which there are many already in the works. This season, we tackle body image and social media, cyberbullying and security, apologizing, and so much more. And as always, the podcast is available for free wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. 
Before I go, a shout out to Communification Podcast listener Donalyn D for her review of episodes four and five. My son Jackson is here to read what Donalyn wrote. Informative and fresh. Love the panelists and the inclusion of Jackson and Vi to provide their pers- perspectives about seeing their parents on the phone versus just hearing about what they might be feeling. The podcast flowed and it was technically smooth. Technically smooth. As a listener of many podcasts, I appreciated the attention to various volume of adjustments for balance sound. Great topic and great podcast. Hey, and Jackson, as a special bonus for making it all the way to the end of this episode, the jingle you're about to hear includes my entire family. My son Jackson did the beatboxing, my daughter Vaipuna singing, because of your feedback saying she had to be a part of it. I agree. And my husband and I harmonizing. It really was a team effort. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Welcome to the Ohana. Beautification.